Good morning and welcome to Unusual Activity powered by FinancialJuice.com with George Avedon and Milton Marmonides. Thank you for joining us this 5th of February 2015. Lots happening this morning, certainly overnight news. And we are in the midst of earnings season. Uh, let's take a check on S&P futures. Let's jump right into uh, what we are seeing in terms of volatility. We, have see, we see S&P futures higher by just about 15 handles at 2044.75. Uh, we'll get into the technicals with Milton in just about 10 minutes or so. Uh, <clears throat> crude oil higher by 95 cents this morning at 49.38. Again, below that 50 mark, uh, we, we've been hearing that that 50 mark is a beginning to be an interesting level there for the oil. Again, we'll get into the technicals in a little bit here. Gold lower by two dollars at twelve hundred sixty-two and forty cents. We have <clears throat> the ten-year at one point eight one two, slightly higher yield than we were about an hour ago or so. Uh, the the dollar, the DXY folks, uh, a little bit uh, continuing its volatility uh, this morning. <clears throat> At 93.876, lower by 0.119. We were higher uh, before the, the the plethora of uh, economic data that was coming out this morning, uh, and the euro was lower. Uh, now it is higher, uh, currently at 1.1428, 1 uh, holding that 114 handle at 0 0.0005. So clearly, uh, we the volatility uh, continues uh, in force uh, both in the macro uh, equity markets, in currencies, commodities, energies. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> we'll continue to monitor this throughout the show and in the UA app here. So let's jump into yesterday's trading day. We had a little bit of a mixed. Uh, uh, market Dow Jones Industrial Average higher by 0 0.04 uh, percent. S&P 500 was lower by 0 0.42 percent. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, the Nasdaq uh, lower by 0.23 percent. So again, a uh, little bit of a mixed uh, market in the U.S. Uh, yesterday, uh, we can take a look at volatility yesterday. Um, really, within a 10 handle uh, range uh, for really the better part of a day, uh, there was some um, uh, late day, I would say the last, last half hour, a little bit of an increased volatility, um, and we'll uh, so it finished. To the downside um, in the SPX uh, by 0.42 percent. Uh, getting into <clears throat> getting into this morning, what we're watching certainly um, out of the Middle East, uh, ISIS, ISIL Times. There are uh, various headlines coming out, uh, and always interesting to hear that and and the reaction uh, from the markets um, from. A little bit more on the geopolitical slash energy. Uh, <clears throat> very interesting. We noted yesterday, uh, since the death of uh, King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia, uh, oil has been on a bit of a uh, rebound. Um, and again, nothing concrete that uh, that's coming out on on energy or but outside of just rhetoric, outside of opinions. Uh, certainly, uh, initially, Saudi Arabia came out and said, look, there's really no change in sentiment in terms of production. But again, we did see, uh, we did see an interesting rise in oil uh, as of late within the last week, uh, last five trading days. <clears throat> 
excuse me, one of the things uh, that we're keeping an eye on um, is the geopolitical situation, certainly in Europe. Uh, Greece is certainly on the radar. Uh, obviously, uh, we keep an eye on uh, Russia as well. Um, interesting uh, dynamic, certainly uh, Russia is in its uh, woes, certainly with uh, woes, excuse me, certainly with uh, oil being down uh, for quite a quite a long time, whether or not we have a little bit of rebound compared to 107 uh, earlier in the year certainly has an effect on individual countries. Um, and so a little bit of uh, interesting uh, dynamics here. So again, uh, uh, according to Ushakov, uh, Putin invites uh, Tsipras to visit Russia. Um, it's some uh, gr Greek finance minister Varoufakis says that they will do everything they can in order to avoid Greece defaulting on debt. Um, also, uh, with respect to Greece, according to reports in German press, the ECB have granted the Greek central bank ELA of around 60 billion euros. Uh, folks, and if you take a look at the... Um, uh, more or less of a, a, a pie chart, if you will, um, and the debt that's being uh, that, that Greece is holding. Certainly, uh, we see the the uh, you know you can see the the underlying worries. Why should Greece default on debt? You know who um, who is not the beneficiary? Certainly of that, um, and clearly in the in the, in Greek debt, um, uh, the EFSF certainly is a uh, tr it's considerable part of their debt. Um, also, uh, other ECB debt as well. So that's something that is uh, concerning folks in Europe, and that's something that we are keeping an eye on uh, rather closely. Um, so themes for the day: uh, we have euro volatility. Um, it, although it's uh, higher this morning, it is off its recent lows. Remember, we did go down to that 112 uh, handle uh, in euro, and that's something that we'll, we'll continue to uh, look at. Uh, U.S. dollar strength, again, lower this morning on the U.S. dollar, DXY. Uh, it's a it's a index of uh, U.S. dollar versus 10 other uh, currencies, but again, off its recent highs. Really, uh, what we're looking at is this recent volatility in oil. Yesterday, we had uh, it, 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 it looks like a more than an eight uh, percent move there in terms of volatility, and that is rather impressive. We had some time ago, a few weeks back, where oil had a, a volatile day of about ten. Uh, 10 percent so again we are in uh, rather unique um, uh, vo volatile days here so also from central bankers or uh, as we're w uh, seeing and hearing uh, speakers from the Fed within the last couple of days and today uh, want to hear if there's any uh, conversation about deflation would like to hear if there's any conversation about monetary policy but specifically among central bankers globally uh, we're see we'd like to see if there's any comment on deflation and how they uh, it, it, you know should that come up in conversation what's the what's the rhetoric what's that what's the, the those topics of conversation um, certainly after the Greek election we're seeing uh, um, uh, we're seeing the Greek finance minister making the rounds uh, Tsipras making the rounds uh, so uh, lots of uh, lots of activity there. We'll see if there's actually anything that uh, substantial develops out of that. But again, uh, makes for good uh, <clears throat> pardon the expression Greek drama. Um, certainly the rates um, are something that we're keeping an eye on rather closely. Uh, Ten year again 1.798. Uh, the th the 30 year 2.394. We went above that 2.4 level yesterday. Below the, below that now again, keeping a rather uh, close eye on that. And something we've been mentioning, uh, it tends to come up in conversation, but really is this Russian economy, folks. Um, and that's something that uh, um, is developing. And although not many people are uh, commenting on this, uh, we feel that should oil continue its 
uh, lower price, whether it comes up to 50 or 55, maybe 60. Um, certainly Russia is uh, um, left uh, holding the bag, if you will, um, specifically on oil. Certainly their, their, uh, their economy is, uh, is of concern, uh, and that's something that we're keeping an eye on rather closely, specifically with Ukraine. We'll get into that in, in a little bit. Um, also, uh, clearly we're in the midst of earnings season, uh, and that's uh, also impacting markets. So always keep an eye on that uh, as well. Uh, a quick uh, an economic uh, roundup this morning. Baltic Dry Index fall, uh, falls another 0.9% to 564 points. Initial jobless claims 278,000 versus 290. Continuing claims at 2.4, right in line with expectations. Labor costs for Q4 higher by 2.7%. Expected was 1.2. Interesting there. Uh, we know that the the uh, U.S. central bankers, uh, U.S. Uh, Fed, uh, certainly keeps a very close eye on that. Uh, trade balance lower by 46.6 billion, uh, and versus the 38 billion uh, to the downside uh, estimated. Uh, so let's um, uh, please to bring in Milton. And Milton, before we get, we are also um, we will have a special guest on this morning. Uh, from uh, Futures Trader 71. Uh, that's due in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Morad Oscar. So again, uh, looking forward to speaking with him uh, shortly. Mil let's get into the technicals. Certainly a lot's been happening in terms of volatility. What's your, uh, what are you seeing this morning? What's on your radar? Well, it's all about volatility in every aspect of every market oil ten-year the markets currencies so basically everything is volatility everyone is talking about the volatility lately in the past the whole in the beginning in, in the in the uh, beginning of the year since the beginning of the year it's been non so volatile plus or minus one percent moves intraday a, a three-day twenty percent move in oil when when's the last time anyone has heard of that before you know, you're having, you're having extreme volumes, extreme movements, and you just need to be careful on everything you do. A few, um, let's just jump into real quick the text. Uh, let's start off with the ES. The ES, right now we're looking at a um, the upside number about that 2050 level. Once that number or if that number is broken, we're looking at the next level, which is key, the 2064-65 level. Currently, you know, we've been talking to people yesterday you mentioned the fact that we are in a small downtrend with a 20, 50, 55 break. Could, you know, X that one out, but we're going to keep an eye on it. We're going to keep a close eye on the volume as well and see what really happens within the next day or so. Yesterday we had a strong day, and in the last, what, 15, 20 minutes, the yeah. market just collapsed. Right. You know, because of uh, headlines out of, the, out of Greece and the ECB. So we are in a very volatile market. Headline risk is across the board, people. So, you know, be careful. You know, make sure you have your outs, and you know, keep in mind that any comment here or there from anywhere overseas could gyrate this market plus or minus percentages. So, we're looking at that 2050 upside initially. Our downside support level on the ES is 2028-2030. We're keeping an eye on those both levels. The range is pretty big. Let's see what happens during the day today. Tomorrow morning we have the employment situation, so that's a, uh, a big one coming up. So we're going to keep an eye on that as well, and we'll move forward on that side. Next we'll jump on to is oil. Um, oil has been uh, very volatile as well. We're looking at a, uh, a crazy move yesterday on it from the, the, the large $4, $5 gain the other day. We're looking at you know the levels we're, we're keeping an eye on as resistance level is right here basically at the fifty dollar number. Support we're looking at that forty eight dollar level. Keep an eye on both those levels. We have a two dollar range in between there. We can see the volatility uh, you know continue in oil until people get a good footing on exactly what's going on here. We have a weakness in the dollar, so today we may have a strength in oil. Keep that in mind as well. But right now fifty dollars to the upside. We're looking at $48 support on CL. 
very tight views, very tight um, you know levels, but it's key to understand that 48 downside break could continue to a 46, 45 level. So when 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 we mean a break, you got to understand that the volatility in these names is tremendous. So one, two, three dollar moves could happen easily, as we saw yesterday. Um, which goes into effect of the, our next uh, indicator, the VIX. VIX is currently trading and closed yesterday at about 18.33. It hit that 16 number. We mentioned for a while, 14 to 16, that's the support levels. It hit 16, I believe 1680s yesterday. Bounced right off of that, case in point, the Greek news, but still. Bounced right off of that, hit, the, hit, hit and closed at 18.33. 1416 support, 2021 upside resistance. We are in that tradable range. Until one is broken, we're going to continue being in that range. And the volatility is there. Once those levels could be broken, we may see continuation to the upside or downside in these markets. Gold. <clears throat> Same thing in gold. 1250 downside, 1300 upside. We're watching closely. The volatility is back and forth, back and forth on the name. Keeping a close eye on all that. As of now, we are at the low end of this of the uh, the tradable range at the support levels. Watching that 1250 number, it's try it, it attempted it numerous times, hitting about 1255, 1258. We're gonna keep an eye on it today. It's trading down this morning about two and a half points at 1262. Watching the volume, watching the levels. If anything happens, we'll make sure to update in the UA forum. And lastly. Currencies, we know we, talk, we just talked about the U.S. dollar. is weakness this morning off of the morning news, off initial claims, and the, um, what was the other one this morning, George? Uh, the, trade the, trade, the trade balance data. So the dollar is weak on that. Ten-year yield is weak, on, also, is weak also on that. We're keeping an eye on the currencies, keeping an eye on the dollar, keeping an eye on the euro. If anything happens throughout the day, Case in point, yesterday by the close with Greece, you can have very volatile fluctuations in currencies and in markets. So all we can say is, you know, stay nimble, stay tight, and good luck. George, thank you, Milton. So there you get, there you have, folks, our uh, morning technical analysis wrap up, uh, prep, if you will, for your. Uh, for your day, what we'd like to do now, spend a little bit more time on, on macro uh, information in terms of just preparing yourself uh, for the environment. We'll take a look at commodities, energy, and raw materials. Uh, let's take a look here where we are uh, in crude oil again at that $49.09 area now right around that $49 higher by 62 cents even this morning uh, rather impressive volatility at least a uh, over a dollar now in terms of uh, movements in, in, in oil um, gasoline higher by 0 0.0147 at 1.4973 natural gas at uh, 2.630 lower by 0 0.032 and this is something that we've been uh, following rather closely uh, in, in, in in that gas and that is it's, it's below the three dollar mark and, and folks frankly uh, you know for, anecdotally from a demand perspective in the in the Northeast here we've had a uh, rather uh, active winter as of late and interesting that Nat gas um, perhaps from a demand perspective, isn't reacting to that. But again, just a pure anecdotal there. But again, way below that, nicely below that $3 mark at 2.625. Heating oil higher by 0 0.0184 at 1.750. Uh, gold this morning lower by $2.60 at $1,261.80. Silver. Uh, uh, above that $17 range, so remember we hit that 18, went above that, uh, just like gold hit that 1300 level. Went now we're uh, well below that at $17, 18 and a half cents, lower by 21 cents this morning. Platinum lower by $3.50 at $1,235.40. Uh, cocoa higher by $4. 
uh, at 27.28. Let's uh, jump into uh, the yield curve, and this is something that we've been uh, watching uh, rather closely. Um, and that is so we have the five year at 1.292. Uh, we have the 10-year 1.796, and the 30-year uh, we have that at 2.394. Um, so again, one of the things that we're watching for is we're as we're uh, listening for any kind of monetary comments uh, with respect to uh, yield, uh, with respect to um, uh, Fed speakers. Uh, it's in season now. Um, and uh, you know we'll continue to keep it, but really the the conversation here is um, is the yield curve compared to uh, more than a year ago, and this is something we bring up on a on a daily basis, um, and it's really been in this, uh, especially on the ten and the thirty year, rather uh, interesting range. Um, the the ten year below the two, the 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 thirty year below the two point five. Remember, we were up, up near the four percent on the thirty year, so that's a significant uh, figure. hundred, call it one hundred and sixty basis point uh, to the downside on yield. So again, and really for the five year, uh, the one point two nine five, we were up in the one point six six area, uh, really not too long ago, about a month, uh, a little bit over a month ago or so. Uh, so again, very interesting dynamics as we are uh, preparing to uh, for the open in about just about 10 minutes or so. So folks, we are very pleased uh, to have with us uh, <clears throat> Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Morad Oscar uh, from FuturesTrader71.com. Uh, Morad, thank you so much for joining us to uh, on Unusual Activity. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Uh, so th thank you for joining us. Um, tell us. So uh, tell us. Uh, you know, give us a little bit of background on yourself. Uh, how long have you been? Uh, doing this, and and then we'll we'll jump into uh, a, a bit of the markets this morning. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've been uh, trading futures uh, since 2002, um, and I did. Uh, I was a, a an equity SOS bandit. Uh, that's what we were called, I guess. Uh, trading out of Florida. Uh, before that, we we're trading equity equity stocks, uh, Nasdaq stocks. And uh, and it was all order flow, high volume scalping, uh, basically doing a couple million shares a day per trader in major issues like Dell, Microsoft, JDSU, and so on. Back then, uh, that game dried up once we went digital. Um, uh, with uh, with the prices, it went from teenies, uh, you know, fractions uh, to to decimals, uh, and um, and there was just a very it was very difficult to make markets in those products and uh, I found out that there was a prop shop here in Chicago where I live now uh, and have been for the last 12 years um, that was hiring traders and it was a mo it was also order flow scalping high volume stuff so we actually a friend of mine and I jumped into a car and drove for 20 hours and showed up the next day uh, and kind of uh, battled to get a position in prop uh, I was with that firm for about nine months. I became profitable in about six months, and uh, and left the firm, uh, and then started my own prop shop. Started to trade for myself and started my own prop shop, and uh, and and actually uh, was was training traders. Uh, a lot of guys coming off the pit, um, and also new guys. And then uh, as 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 I left and started to trade on my own, I realized that it was much better to trade in the community. So I created a prop shop and started to create kind of an official training program and stuff for my traders, and that's really the path that I've followed. Um, and then in 2009, uh, I, I, um, I found myself just wanting to, to do more, uh, and that's when I came online uh, and uh, discovered Twitter and so forth and started posting live trades. Uh, and just started to gather a following um, from that point forward. So that's where we are. Uh, that's where I am. And now, uh, you know, a couple years ago, I started a brokerage called uh, Stage Five Trading, 
uh, which I know Omar is very familiar with, uh, and uh, and and the the intent for this brokerage is not to be another you know commission turn and churn kind of house. It's more uh, directed towards taking my prop experience. I was very successful doing prop uh, in futures and bringing that to the people who um, who join uh, the brokerage. So uh, prop tools. Um, consistent, you know, continuing education through webinars. We do AAQs, our Ask a Question webinars every uh, Friday and so on. But I'm, I'm not really a broker, although I'm registered. Uh, so I'll let one of my brokers talk about that if you want to have him on. But for now, I'm more interested in what the market's doing uh, and where we are and the wrap-up you just did. Great. No, uh, thank you, uh, Morit. So, um, l l let's jump into um, maybe a, a little bit higher level. W w what do you typically uh, trade? What do you typically uh, watch on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, you know, really on a on a higher level. Uh, give us some examples that um, uh, uh, you know trades that you like to be involved in. Um, anything particular that you like to watch? So. <clears throat> The thing I comment on the most is the most popular product out there, which is the S&P uh, um, minis. Um, but really, it's not yeah. my main trade. It's it's not the product that I cut my teeth on. It's uh, it's it's slower than I'd like. Except recently, the volatility's picked up, and it's been really awesome. The rotations and the and the moves, and there have been very uh, interesting. But the products that I've cut my teeth on are, are Eurex based products, the DAX, uh, Euro stocks. Uh, love the Russell, uh, some crude oil, some gold. The thinner, faster, kind of crazier products. Because I was always an order flow scalper. Uh, but I switched over into a longer term view uh, once uh, once the high frequency shops uh, took over uh, the trade. And I, I, I tested many things. I looked at indicators. I looked at uh, um, you know geometry and all that stuff. But the thing that made sense to me was market profile. And after a while, uh, it didn't make sense to me anymore because it was strictly time based. I discovered volume profiling. Uh, and uh, and basically created a an approach a holistic approach that is covering uh, what the market is doing using volume profiles and volume profiles are these things here on your screen you see them in yellow and blue in this uh, daily chart this is a pit session daily chart uh, this is what's called my composite chart and from here I'm basically looking at the big picture uh, this is the the range that we've been in since October 31st we've been in balance uh, the market can only be in two conditions. It's either balancing or it's trending, balance or imbalance. It's either accepting prices and liking those prices and is facilitating trade at those prices a lot. And so you get these bulgy, big bulgy profiles. Or it's trending like you saw yesterday um, with with the drop. When, I, when we look at just the drop, we'll see that the profile looks very, very different. The, the profile is... Um, much more, much thinner. Uh, prices are not being tested um, properly and things like that. So when we look at this red profile here, you can see that it's uh, really, um, it's really thin until the market finds balance again. So once we hit that uh, 30 quarter area, which was carried over from the, from Tuesday, uh, the market bounces up and it starts to balance and it forms what's called a point of control here, which is the the most traded price and that becomes temporarily that becomes the most fair price given the latest and greatest uh, piece of news that we were dealing with uh, and my job is to anticipate breaks from those balance areas and to anticipate when trend is happening when balance is happening and the most important part of the whole thing is who is in control of the market um, people like to say buyers are in control sellers are in control um, there are always, especially in futures, there's always an equal number of buyers as there are sellers. Without the same number, there would not be a trade. So there has to be something else driving the movement. And what, what, what's driving the movement is which time frame is in control of, of the action. Is it, uh, is it the scalper, day trader, or what we call a short-term trader time frame? Is it the intermediate time frame, the... Uh, the you know the the swing the swing uh, traders the swing hedge hedge products 
uh, swing institutional or is it the long time frame? Uh, and we can detect, um, based on some very basic things, we can detect who is likely to be in control and then adjust our trading accordingly. And that's, that's something that gets lost on uh, a lot of the people that I've met uh, and have been following me online. It's a little refinement that people can't really get wrap their heads around. And it all depends on context. Where are we? What have we done? What are we doing? Um, that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I appreciate that. So if we can just get into uh, the, the, you know, just the details of that, how, how are you able to uh, detect whether it's a short-term, intermediary, uh, you know, longer-term? Can, can, can you uh, dive into that a little bit deeper for us? Sure. So the the because we're in balance, we've been in balance since October 31st. The long time frame is not in control. The long time frame has done its job. If I zoom out and look at, you know, what the S&P has done for for a while, uh, mm -hmm. my charts goes back to October uh, 2013. They've gotten the job done. They've pushed prices uh, quite handily. Um, the market, the long term time frame is well invested in the market. Since then, the market's been in balance. The market just opened. Uh, the market's been in balance since October 31st. So the long time frame is not really active in here. The intermediate time frame is. Uh, okay. The intermediate time frame tends to test uh, levels like weekly levels, compo what I call composite levels, or bigger time frame levels, levels that have cre that are created over a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Um, and and it, it generally it uh, it pushes through day levels. So it, let's look at let's look at today as an example, just because we're live Please, here. Please, yeah, sure. So we opened right at uh, right at uh, Tuesday's high. Uh, we immediately find sellers at 47. So we just opened uh, just a few seconds ago, really a minute ago, and we've already got a swing high. So we can already see. That seller stepped in at 2047. The overnight high is 4775. That's the high for the Globex session, and we were not able to push there. The, there's a statistic um, that says that 98% uh, of the time, 97, 98% of the time, depending on how much data you pull in, uh, we take out either the overnight high or the overnight low. So far, uh, the traders that are involved in here couldn't even take that out before they found the seller at 47. So it's back to testing the open. This tells me that the short-term time frame is in control right now. There isn't because if there was an intermediate time frame controlling this, they're executing 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand contracts, and an overnight high or prior high, a prior day's high or prior day's close is insignificant to them. They get a okay. ticket that says. You get to, they have a ticket that says fill twenty at the op fill twenty thousand at the open in this particular range better than VWAP or whatever or discretionary or whatever and they push through prices very quickly. Okay, so so in terms of you know uh, order sizes, you mentioned order sizes. So outside of order sizes, is there anything else that you like to watch for? Um, in, in that in that difference between the the short term intermediary long term is there anything that's um, any other indicators that you like to watch for? So I don't use in, in indicators in the traditional sense. I'm basically strictly price action based. So you see here we cross back into the open and we're pushing lower. So the seller uh, is more aggressive right now. Uh, the 47 becomes the opening swing high. We don't know what the opening swing low yet. We haven't found our buyer yet. This may be it right here. And then once I know where the first aggressive seller stepped in, the first aggressive buyer stepped in, that becomes my opening swing. The opening swing is not like an opening range. It's not based on minutes. Um, it's based on price action. So this is our opening swing. So now it's my job to look to see how that opening swing high and opening sw swing low is, uh, is treated. Uh, the trades that come into the market early on are market on open orders, MOO orders, uh, and I want to see what the temperament is for those right. traders who are making those decisions overnight and then executing at the open. Right. Um, and so this is what this this is the first step to tracking where we are. The the most important thing that has happened so far is where we open. We open at 2044. Yesterday, the most valuable price is this pink line right here. You could see that the most volume executed at 2040. We're above it. 
where it's a balanced profile, so we have a value high of 42 and a quarter, we have a value low of 33 and a half, and we're holding above it. So essentially what this market's saying is even though we accepted these prices and we were good with these prices a lot yesterday, so we can look at the volume uh, of how much traded here. Uh, you see these numbers tell me how much yeah. volume traded there. Uh, even though we accepted these prices so far, we don't we don't really think that that's value anymore. We're actually looking higher. So the overnight high is vulnerable. I expect it to be taken out. And my expectation, as long as it doesn't fall into the prior day's value area, uh, my expectation is for new highs. And then we start to look at the bigger time frame. Uh, I start to pull in the, the bigger chart to figure out, OK, what's, what's there? What's next? What is it likely to test next? What's, what it's likely to test next? Um, is the uh, the 2053 this uh, this little notch out here? This is the next most valuable price or most fair price, and then we have a weekly high. Uh, beyond that, we have a weekly high at 55 right here. Uh, but the key price above that we're looking at, the key price that we are are looking to test again is 2060. This black line right here. Uh, this price has been in play for quite some time. We pushed it by four ticks last time. We came up short by three ticks last time. Uh, the time after that, uh, we have what's what's called a, what's basically called a local uh, weak high, where the market has tested, pulled back, tested again. If this price was too expensive, the market wouldn't have come back up here. It would have rejected it. Uh, so that's where I'm gunning for. If it takes out the 2060. Uh, in the next uh, in today's session or the next couple of sessions, uh, then new highs are likely at 2088.75. That's the intermediate term uh, outlook. Uh, so as we break levels, I'm looking at what's next, what's next, what's next. But I'm keeping the bigger picture context in mind, and that's that's the thing that's very hard to teach. You know, having traded so many prop guys, um, and have been have been working with uh, our traders at stage five, that's the hard part for people to get keeping the big picture in place while trading inside of your sandbox, which is you know a couple of minutes to a couple of hours, depending on whether you're scalping or just day trading. Uh, so you, you see here, it could not push up to that 47 before it found sellers again. It's telling me that definitely the um, short-term traders in control. Short-term traders do not tend to create trends, intermediate term traders do. Short term traders are just providing and taking liquidity and making right. markets. So what this is doing is it's consolidating. If it's consolidating, it's not long before there's enough energy here in the form of contracts held by buyers or sellers for it to break one way or another. And my primary trade idea for this morning uh, that I just went over on a trader bike right before your show uh, is is that it's likely to break into the 2040, um, fight this a little bit, battle here for a little bit, and then find its way back up and into new highs. Uh, that's that's my primary trade idea. So I'm looking for clues right now as to you know whether that's going to take place, and I use statistical studies to f to figure out what that edge is uh, as much as possible. I hope that all makes sense. It's a lot of information. No, it, it, it certainly does, Morad. It's it's a, certainly an a, a interesting way of looking at the market. Certainly, uh, uh, the, you know, price action and and it, we you know we follow price action as well with respect to, in, in addition to uh, volume spikes, uh, and that's something that we, as we monitor. Uh, specific news on, on you know on the on the underlying equities. Uh, we do watch uh, equity derivatives rather closely and how they affect the underlying security, uh, and uh, you know various news items uh, throughout the day, including uh, insider tra tra insider transactions, how they actually impact uh, the individual securities on price action and how uh, folks listening to uh, both listening to our program and and uh, watching the UA app, um, how they can position themselves uh, in the market. I, one of the questions I had for you was, um, do you, you know, it, it could be a yay or nay, but do you watch uh, or do you listen for specific news that y you may think that may affect at least the um, 
shorter term or intermediary uh, time frames or intermediary uh, uh, traders, if you will, any specific global news or anything um, that you keep an eye on on a daily basis? I know we do, but what's your thought on that? Okay. Um, so I recognize that I'm trading a product that's built on the 500 S&P stocks, and they're built on the S&P index. I, I still don't watch equities at all. I don't. I, I have no uh, perspective on watching equities at all. But okay. news definitely, uh, news definitely uh, is is a key factor. I have uh, uh, actually three news feeds, <laughs> news squawk feeds that push information in. Most of it is just noise, but getting something like the ECB news yesterday is, is a huge advantage. Uh, I'm looking for more macro news. Like if, uh, if an analyst uh, downgrades a stock or um, if, if, uh, if the earnings of a stock get revised or if there's a revision issued or whatever, I don't pay attention to that, although it might move the S&P 500 if it's a big enough issue. Um, but I'm looking for macro stuff, especially um, money supply, uh, central bank stuff. That stuff really governs uh, how we trade. I mean, you're looking at the S&P here dropping uh, 20 points uh, within, you know, 10 minutes on something that, that is normal ECB policy, that we will not take your uh, debt. Uh, for to collateralize further loans because your debt is now has, has been downgraded to basically being worthless right. and that's to be expected but the market has a 20 point reaction I can do a, a lot with 20 points um, so that's what I'm paying attention to if that answers your question sure a absolutely so is is there anything on your radar right now uh, in terms of the macroeconomic perspective in terms of uh, maybe you know ge geo policy uh, you know, we know that there's a lot going on in Europe. We know that there's a lot going on, uh, you know, in the Middle East, of course. But in terms of macroeconomic, I'm sure you watch the Fed very closely. Um, w what's on your radar as we're going into the rest of 2015, certainly? Uh, and we'll ask you a little bit about the, the volatility in January uh, in, in a moment. But any type of... Um, um, kind of a surprises that may be uh, in store for the markets that you're kind of concerned about or at least that you're you put it on your list of uh, things to watch that's an awesome question I don't generally don't spend too much time because I I did start as a scalper and I do trade in a short-term range sure. I don't spend too much time doing a lot of research but I do know I I, I do know that I need to watch uh, what oil does, uh, I have an oil chart that on the side here, but I also have an oil sure. chart down here, and I'm watching what it does consistently. This is, uh, oil to me is a big tell for what's coming. Oil has not dropped so far in the past without some serious economic repercussions, uh, and we have yet to see those. Uh, the other thing that's relevant, uh, that's relevant here is uh, is Fed policy right? The Fed's been talking, and the and the Fed funds rate uh, in the futures have been pricing in some sort of a uh, Fed rate hike in the right. spring or the f at least the first half of this year. I think that's a long shot. There's I just cannot see how the Fed is going to sit here and raise rates when uh, countries like the UK. Uh, the Bank of England was in the best shape uh, as far as uh, as far as an economy ready to raise rates has stopped doing that and has continued uh, like it announced today has continued its uh, asset purchase target uh, program uh, to me that's more stimulus uh, the ECB putting out that uh, 60 billion euro per month uh, program uh, earlier in the, uh, or, or last month uh, making that announcement uh, going negative on its rates uh, the Swiss National Bank releasing their the uh, the the, um, the 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 lock on the euro um, India reducing rates uh, right. China flooding the market with money Japan economics have been flood it, it just makes no sense to me to sit right. here and go yeah look out the Fed you know the economy may be getting overheated and the Fed may raise rates I think those people 
Um, I think I just don't see it. I don't see it. So to me, uh, anything and everything, as it has been for the last, unfortunately, for the last eight years, anything and everything that the Fed says uh, is really important to this market. Where uh, th think of it as a the market's like a heroin addict, sure. and it's and it's fix comes from the Fed as opposed to earnings and what the uh, underlying stocks are doing. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, and I really love it that the, the QE program was done and the Fed stepped out of that mess. That's what gives us these opportunities, and what's, that's what allows this market to, uh, to float more freely. Since then, the auction has been much cleaner, and I, I expect it to be. I'd love to see interest rates go up, to be honest with you, as a trader. I know it's not good for many businesses and so on. I'd love to see interest rates go up because um, when there's an interest rate uh, spread, there's a risk there, and right. so there's a lot more that needs to be done with the market for for uh, various entities to kind of hedge or get the financing that they need. Um, it gives our economy the ability to operate on its own, and, and they're not ready to do that. Here's the break higher. It's not able to get back into yesterday's value. Here's the break higher. So as I said, if it does not get back down here, then I'm expecting new highs, and I'm looking for that test of 53 sure. quarter. Um, so yeah, so that's you know, so the Fed, ECB, um, starting to pay attention to the to the Bank of China. Um, not too concerned about Japan. I think they're going to keep uh, spinning their wheels now for twenty some odd years, trying to get the stimulus going. Um, but mainly, it's uh, it's crude oil speaks it says a lot to me, uh, and of course the ECB, Fed, Bank of England, and so on. No, I, I, those are good points, Morad. You know, one of the things that um, you know, it, it, for folks that have been listening to unusual activity for for a bit of time here, um, is the fact that uh, one of the things that we've been mentioning is this proverbial uh, <clears throat> global economic slowdown, quote unquote. Um, you know, there's you know discussion. You know, we talk about the fact that. Uh, the D word deflation has entered the lexicon of you know central bankers and analysts and pundits and so forth. So we tend to be in that camp with you um, in terms of that we're a bit a, a bit skeptical of uh, you know if we're seeing um, you know the, I don't want to say woes but you know certainly. Um, Central bankers or central banks around the world uh, reducing rates. Certainly, the the question here is 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 can the U.S. decouple uh, from the you know uh, the, the the again perceived economic slowdown, specifically in China, Europe. Uh, but the question here is is Morad. So what if so so really it, it seems as though. Uh, the 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 Fed is really setting themselves up a bit, correct? And again, I, I, as we're seeing, uh, the S and P futures uh, uh, extend their gains uh, this morning. Currently at uh, twenty forty eight point seven five, higher by eighteen point seven five now. Uh, Nineteen handles now. Um, should the Fed actually increase? Let's say they increase by a quarter, you know, twenty five basis points sometime in the summer and just stop, right? What give us a situation that that could happen uh, specifically in 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 the futures market? If uh, if the Fed raises rates, um, I think well you're going to see a, a very strong reaction in the yield curve because everybody that thing is so uh, stacked right now. Everybody's right. you know they're they're buying bonds and notes right. at whatever price they can get them. Correct. Uh, so you're going to see a very quick correction there. I would say it's a, it's a political suicide to do that at this point. There's a there's a you know just from a general policy perspective, there's a there's a currency war that's taking place. It's been taking place for uh, I don't know maybe ten years or something. Um, raising rates on 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 the dollar increases its value. Right. Uh, increasing the dollar the dollar's already. Uh, had its the dollar basket's already very very strong. Uh, the dollar's already increased its value substantially against uh, the, the euro and other currencies, and that makes our products harder to sell overseas. Makes demand lower, which means that people are going to get laid off. You know, lower sales, lower revenues, lower stock performance. Right. So overall, the anticipated um, 
reaction would probably be a correction in our equity market um, because it does not help. Uh, QE helps stocks, um, easing helps stocks, uh, raising rates makes the dollar uh, much more valuable and much more expensive to interact with and that's why the ECB let go of uh, you know of the floor here uh, right. and have issued their own tarp except they have a much bigger mess because they're dealing with multiple central banks as opposed to one bank that's deciding for everyone um, so overall that's a net bearish um, a net bearish uh, uh, outcome but right. it's not a bad one because even though the stocks will correct and will will probably push lower maybe into the 1800s 1700s in the S&P we still we now have something a little a little bit more substantial to build on um, we have something that can actually be can actually work in the long run as opposed to oh we're in trouble we're too big to fail so give us some more money and give us some quantitative easing because we're not creating enough jobs type of thing you know right you know I, I look I, I think you bring up some very interesting points and, and something we talk about on a daily basis and especially when when the Swiss uh, National Bank removed that that uh, th that cap, if you will. Um, you know, we saw rather severe reactions uh, across uh, global markets, currencies, uh, you know, e equity markets, futures. Um, certainly, the the ECB's intention uh, is to you know bring down the value of the euro. Uh, with respect to other, you know, major currencies globally, uh, and uh, really to, you know, I I in your case, you know, if if the you know the dollar index increases, right, versus you know the other currencies, it makes it much more expensive, uh, makes the U.S. products certainly much more expensive uh, versus other currencies, and vice versa. Um, or uh, or um, inversely makes the euro much more attractive. Uh, so you know one of the things we you know again not in a conspiratorial perspective, but we're wondering always if if there's a, a, a little bit of a underlying method among the central bankers uh, in in terms of the you know perceived global economic slowdown. Maybe there's a little bit of a um, kind of a coordinated effort here. Uh, among you know global central bankers here because you know if you know you recall when our uh, in the U.S. QE stopped uh, immediately there was uh, you know uh, QE mentioned globally right uh, so clearly um, you know we're we're still under the impression that it's 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 a little bit of a coordinated effort not to be conspiratorial here again but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but <laughs> but but certainly um, you know the, the concern here is you know frankly Europe right uh, if euro if the Europe really gets into a deflationary environment that's really not good right we know that it's not good for anybody uh, we see the you know perceived uh, uh, slowdown in China we saw the RRR you know d decrease uh, 50 bips yesterday. Um, so, you know, th that again, it seems to be from a global perspective a rather interesting uh, environment that we're trading in. Yes, uh, and, and you know what? Um, the way, like I said, there is, there is a currency war, but it's a polite. Correct. War. Correct. Um, the, I, the way I the way I imagine it is, uh, we all live in one neighborhood. The neighborhood gets a fair amount of traffic, and you have your lemonade stand across the street. I have a lemonade stand a, 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 across from you, and everybody down the street has a lemonade stand. Yep. And there's there's a demand for lemonade, but I can't be a hog and be at the front of the street and drop my prices, sell more, you know, use the uh, economies of scale policy sure. because sure. I'm your neighbor. I'm, I'm going to piss you off and you're not going to look out for me and it's going to ruin our neighborhood watch and so on. <laughs> so I have to be polite about the way I'm selling my lemonade. Their lemonade's interest rates and the movement of money. Of course, of course. That's a what's happening. If you, absolutely. If Anybody who believes that there isn't a constant conversation going on between these central banks and that whole idea that the US has been pressuring China to float their currency for the last you know 10 years that's it's all just 
a sure. puppet show for, for the public. This is a coordinated effort. Oh, yeah. uh, when somebody needs money and needs help, everybody steps up. I mean, the, the U.S. Fed was giving advice to the ECB as to how to deal with its uh, correction when it happened in 2009. So it's, it's in our best interest. You know, we, we have a huge trading partner in Europe. Uh, we're very important to them, our products and so forth. We are competitors, but it's, it's you know, watch, watch your typical soccer game or whatever. They might beat the heck out of each other, but when a guy falls, they come up and give him a hand and raise him up. You know, they want him to play. They don't want him to get hurt. This is what, this is what we have, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing because everybody's realizing that we're all connected and we're all tied together and our, our, our destiny depends on each other and, and yeah, it kind of binds us together. No, no doubt. You know, look, I think you bring up really poignant points uh, and that is what we always talk about is this is this concept of a flow of money, right? The, 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 the capital flows and this comes down to it's, – it's Econ 101, right? When – uh, Econ 101, you know, it, it, it's it's really this, uh, it's the conversation of um, if, if 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 it deflation sets in, right, and if, if you know the prices are going to be lower tomorrow than they are today, you're not going to move today. You're not going to do anything today. So it, it, central bank central bankers are absolutely concerned with the flow of money to keep to uh, to not restrict the flow of money in any way. Uh, flow of capital, if you will, and that it, I, we agree with you. I think uh, you know. It, look, it, we're all large players on the, on the global field, but uh, you know, the, the intention is not to have another uh, global um, calamity, if you will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So um, I, I really want to thank you for having me on. I Absolutely. have to hop off. I have another call, Absolutely. but uh, but I appreciate having you you having me on uh, the invite from Amar, and uh, I I wish you guys the best. This is uh this is definitely a very interesting conversation. Absolutely, uh, Morad Oscar. Thank you for joining us from FutureTrader71.com. Morad, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure, and we hope to have you on again. Thank you so Thanks. much for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Uh, folks, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're just uh, nearing that 10 o'clock uh, time here. We'll take a quick check of the futures. Uh, we have the S&P futures higher by 20 handles now at 20, uh, 50. Uh, even now, we have the crude oil higher by $1.87 at uh, $50.29. Uh, we have gold lower by four dollars forty cents at twelve hundred sixty uh, and ten cents in the ten year uh, maintaining that one point eight level one point eight zero seven uh, so folks thanks for joining us it has been unusual activity powered by financialjuice.com with George Avedon and Milton Marmonides thank you for joining us and wishing you good hunting